Ladies and gentlemen, we're delighted, of course, to kick off Random Acts of Kindness, Om Swami Ji, in conversation with Punita Roy. I won't take up too much of your time, but I will give a brief introduction to this session. Ten years ago, in a little village in Varanasi, Om Swami Ji was initiated into the path of renunciation by a Naga saint. Slightly before that, he had renounced material wealth and set out on this journey that I just spoke to you about. Slightly after this, he spent 13 months in intense meditation in the Himalayas. He will today be blessing us with his presence and enlightening us in conversation with Punita Royji, of course, who is the founder trustee of the Yuva Ekta Foundation, who, by the way, will be performing quite an exceptional production uh, on the 26th, I believe. 26th. I'm not performing. Yeah. The foundation, but the, the foundation children is are. performing, of course. And I'm also delighted to announce that there will be a book signing following this session. Again, that will be at the Z kiosk. And with that, I'll hand over to Punita Ji and Om Swami Ji to talk to us about the path to happiness via kindness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pritish. Or Om Swami Ji, Namaskar. Thank you so much for being here and gracing us with your presence. I think it's a privilege to have you here at the Z Jaipur Literature Festival. So uh, I know a lot of you all are eagerly waiting. We have limited time. So um, Swamiji has been a mystic. He's a monk. He's a tantric. And he's a writer. I was just having a brief chat with him before we came in here. And he says he earns his living by writing books. And I found that very interesting, you know, <laughs> because we're normally used to lots of donations, etc. But he said, I just live by what I write. And he's actually written 14 books by now, yes. right? OK, so um, because I was going to be having this conversation with Swamiji, I actually started reading his book. And I was just telling him that the first book, if truth be told, amongst memoir, is a fascinating autobiography of his journey of renunciation. And uh, Swamiji, you know, in today's world, uh, we keep talking about ki hum kal yug mein reh rahe And you, as a child of eight, has this dream where you said, God came to you in your dream. And your entire thing was then for a true inner life, saying that I will have to meet you. And um, you then sort of, you went to Australia at 18, and over the next, I would say, 10, 12 years, set up a multi-million dollar software company. But all the time detached that, I'm going to give this up, and if I'm going to renounce, I need to have something to renounce. What am I sacrificing otherwise? And you stuck to that, and at 30, you just gave it all up. So I want you to just share with us the key points that you remember in that journey, because that was quite, quite a journey for people like me to read about and to get sure. inspired with. So can we, sorry, we need the volume bit up. Can we have the volume up, please? One, two. One, two. Can I do a little stuti with Swamiji? Please, please. Can I borrow please. your mic for a moment? Thank you. I'm sorry, we should have done this. No, no, no worries. So we'll just call upon the Divine Mother uh, to bless this festival and all of you and our beautiful nation. And uh, then we'll, I'll answer your question. Sindura Runa Vigraham 
त्रिनयना मणिक्यमोलिस्फुर तारायक शेखरा स्मृत मुखी मीन वक्षोरुहा पाणिभ्यालिपूर्णरत्न चषक रक्तपल बिभ्रति सौम्यात्नघटस्तर चरण ध्याय परिका माता की जय फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई ऑफर माई ओबीसेंस टू द डिवाइन इन यू विथ हूज ग्रेस वीर ऑल हियर राइट नाउ दिस मोमेंट नारायणी नमस्ते So the question was, uh, I decided one day that I would give up, and why did I give up, or how could I give up at at yes. 30? I think if you have ever lived in a rented house, mm -hmm. then you know your attachment to a rented home is very different to the home if you own it. Yes. If it's a rental property, you look upon it differently. A tap goes off, you say, I'm going to call the landlord. I'm not going to fix it myself. Right. You don't really see the dirty walls, the soiled walls, the same way as you would see your own home. So that sense of ownership is not there. Yes, because that sense of detachment is there. Because you know, one day, I have to move out of this home. Mm -hmm. That impermanence is at the root of detachment. As long as I can remember that I cannot have this body forever. Right. I cannot have this wealth forever. I cannot have my loved ones with me forever. My youth, my wealth, everything is going to wax one day. It's going right. to win one day, sorry. Everything is going to disappear one day. If I can keep that mindfulness, mm. detachment comes naturally. Because what is there to give up anyway. Once somebody asked Mahavira, oh. the founder of Jainism, this seeker said to Mahavira, what have you gained by renouncing? What has meditation or this life of austerity given you, what have you gained? He said, that's the greatest gain I've had. I've lost everything. I've lost everything? Yes. Okay. And by losing everything, I found that I could do without it. In fact, Socrates, you know, the Greek philosopher, used to stand in the middle of the market every single day. For hours, he would do the equivalent of window shopping. But nobody actually ever saw him buy anything. So they said to Socrates, why do you do this? Somebody so intelligent, so brilliant like you, why do you waste your time roaming on the streets through the markets? He said, I look at all the things that are there in various shops and realize, my God, I don't need all of this. <laughs> okay. that my, there are so many things in the world that I don't need. And it's a fabulous thing, that liberation. Because we don't know how deeply we're attached to anything till we are separated from it. True, true, true. If, if I see a rubber band and I, looking at it, you cannot tell its strength yeah. when it's stretched. Does it snap? Or how long can it stretch itself? That's when I know the strength of that band. Right. So when circumstances, people stretch us, mm -hmm. what happens then? Do we snap or do we stretch? That cannot be discovered unless we go through the rigors of life, I feel. Of life, okay. So, but at, <clears throat> so at 30, very, you, know, you had actually gained a lot. But you were still disconnected. No, but what you're saying in terms of renouncing, uh, Swamiji, 
there are many people like, you know, you also had the Naga Baba you mentioned. And there are many people who, on their spiritual journey, do step back, they take different paths, etc. But I think the biggest struggle is with your own inner demons, right? <clears throat> your anger, your hatred, your greed, your lust, your need to just want more. And the insecurity that I may step away, but my insecurity that will all go away one day, right? How do you battle that? Somebody asked uh, Buddha once. Huh. They said to Buddha, do you not miss your previous lifestyle? Do you not miss all that luxury, that opulence, that those, those kingdoms, those people, those subjects you were ruling over? Do you not miss that? Now you are walking around with a begging bowl in your hand. Right. And Buddha said, tell me something. Can you eat the food you have just vomited? It doesn't matter how tasty or delicious that food might have been. The moment it goes down your throat, it becomes sour. Right. Krishna says those sukhas, huh. which the instant gratification will always result in some pain eventually. Right. So, I'm not saying one must uh, renounce the joys of life. Right. By all means, life is there to be lived. It must be lived fully. Every moment must be taken in fully. In fact, that's the least we can do for our lives, to live it fully. fully. To be grateful, to be graceful, to be kind, to be gentle. But the fact or the, the thinking that it is going to stay with me forever is sheer ignorance. In fact, that is the only difference between a mindful person and a not so mindful person. Hmm. A mindful person or an awakened person knows that it is not going to last. Take anything other than uh, your, um, you know, karma. Yes. Nothing is going to last. It's so what is the struggle? Is, is it, yes. yes, is it not better than to accept it? Yes. And then say, okay, this is the truth of my life. Mm. How do I be more graceful? How do I be more grateful? Right. How do I be happier? Right. We, can, we can live through this life by constantly complaining and brooding and, and sulking and skulking. Or we can say, look, this is what it is. I always say, it doesn't matter at what stage of life you are in. Mm. You will have at least one difficult person in your life. Usually that's a spouse, but not always. <laughs> and he's a trigger for you, for your yes. growth? Usually yeah. there's at least one difficult person in our life. And we always think, I wish if this person wasn't there, my life would be so beautiful, life would be so fantastic. Right, so but, peaceful. <laughs> but all it takes is a bit of mindfulness to go back to that period when that person was not in your life. Were you happier? Were you actually completely stress-free? Something else was ruling our mind at that time. Right, right, right. They also say at times that the people who disturb us mirror to us qualities that in ourselves that we don't accept. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yeah. True. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Swami, you have kind of redefined monkhood. Uh, I can keep referring to the book because that's what I've been reading, where you speak about the fact that for self-realization, maybe you don't... It's not important that you step away from the world, even as a householder, if you're mindful, you know. Uh, you can begin the journey. Perhaps somewhere around the journey, you start moving further and further away from things that have brought you pleasure earlier. Um, I want to ask you that we keep talking about the present era as a world of Kalyog. You know, we say that there is so much of... Um, so much of animosity, so much of hatred, so much of divisiveness today. How can we, within this noise, this clutter, uh, you know, the sense of being overwhelmed by these forces, how can one chart out a path, a path for yourself that is more peaceful, that is more compassionate, that is kinder? I think <clears throat> there is a practical aspect to it. Yes. And then there is a spiritual aspect. At a practical level, I would say our mind is an incredibly powerful thing. Mm. Human mind is, is why we have grown, why we have progressed, why we have evolved. evolved yeah. So be careful 
about what we feed, what we feed our minds with. So if I am going to feed it with distressing literature, with negative literature, with the kind of literature that aggravates my suffering, mm. then when I'm in my quiet moment, the same thing will keep on playing back, keep playing back in my head. I always say, to know how peaceful you are within, spend some time with yourself. Ekanta, solitude. Mm. Most people will get depressed very quickly in solitude. And if you are by yourself, with yourself, in your own company, without all the gadgets, without your laptop phone, without any book, just you with yourself, what happens then? Do you feel happy? Do you feel positive? Or do you feel bored? If you are bored in your own company, then I think I've said the rest. Then how can we expect the world to rejoice in our company and people are constantly then looking for people who can make them happy and that is the root cause of suffering when I think somebody else yes. is responsible for my feelings. Right. If I take responsibility for what I am feeling, I would be happy. I'm saying, I'm feeling bad, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling emotional, I'm feeling sentimental, I am responsible for it, why? Right. So the practical aspect is, we need to be careful what are we feeding our mind with. At a spiritual level, it's the evolution of one's very consciousness. Mm. Within, within the 7 plus billion people on the planet, we have 8.4 million different kinds of species. And I'm not talking about animals and birds and so on. Mm. I'm speaking about human beings. Some people have the consciousness of a lion. Some have the consciousness of a lion. Yes. Some people have the consciousness of a fox. All the foxes are very innocent beings, but somehow we we regard cunningness with slyness. With, yes. yes. So some people have the, uh, the the consciousness of a cow, some of a deer, and so on. This evolution of consciousness is attained when I sit quiet. Mm. or when I live my life mindfully. Because if I am mindful, at least I will know what I am after. Right. If you look at some of the greatest people, uh, the saints, whether that's Guru Nanak Dev or even Jesus Christ or Moses for that matter or some of our saints in, in this culture, they all spend at least some time in solitude. Absolutely, yes. Even Prophet Muhammad did. His realization came from there. Why? Because it's only when you're by yourself that you get the time to listen to yourself. Right. Otherwise, we are constantly listening to the chattering of the mind and the world around us. And I'll tell you my, famous, uh, my favorite story. Huh, please. When Buddha gained awakening, he was walking and two people stopped him. They said to Buddha, are you God? Buddha said, there is no God. No, I'm not God. There is no God. You must be some celestial being then, a Gandharva. He said, no, I'm not a Gandharva. Oh, you must be a saint. No, I'm not a saint, Buddha said. Well, they said, there's something different about you and us. We look like mangoes sucked dry. And you look so radiant. There has to be some difference between you and I. Right. Buddha said, of course. I didn't say there is no difference. There is a difference. And the difference is, you are sleeping and I am awake. Am awake. Buddha means awake. Ya nisha sarva bhuta nam tasyam jagrati sanyami. Yasyam jagrati bhutani sa nisha pashyatu mani. When the whole world is wide awake, Khantai Krishna says, the yogi sleeps. And when, when the yogi is wide awake, the whole world is sleeping because when are we awake? When we have a need to be fulfilled or a desire to be fulfilled. What happens when the tummy is full? The first thing that happens is we feel sleepy. Right. So when you are full internally, when you are content, at that time, everything is okay. Life is fine. You could not care less. Because this world is going to have opinions about you. Some people will say good things. Some people will say bad things. We cannot stop that. We don't have to stop it. We shouldn't stop it. I mean, let them say what they want to say. How does that change my world? 
Right, right. Somebody says he's a saint. Okay, thank you. Somebody says he's a sinner. All right, where do I meet you? You know, that right. kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just going to come to that, Swamiji. I work a lot with young people. Right. And I've seen that mental health is it's almost an epidemic now across the world. I mean, the number of young people, especially in their teens, who are going through issues of anxiety. And anxiety at different levels, you know, some also very depressed. But the whole sense of judgment, of feeling that, you know, uh, people are looking at me, I'm from whether it's the physical body shaming, to I'm not good enough, I'm a failure, you know. And uh, I think a lot of people, you know, in my generation, we, I've had friends saying, oh, but you know, their mind is weak. We didn't have those issues earlier. Maybe we didn't have the vocabulary to express it, I don't know, you know. So I want to ask you, I mean, is there more anxiety today? And what is it that one could tell a young person, you know? Uh, you spoke about solitude. Does one need to get into a practice of maybe five minutes of solitude and then that lead to a meditative state of mind? What would be a practical thing to be able to reach out to a young person? Good question. I think there is more anxiety today than it's ever been. And why would that And I think it's because of this uber-connected world. Okay. Because now we are reading what is happening all over the world. I'm seeing people on Facebook who are always holidaying, always partying, and we think, wow, everybody's life is perfect okay, yes. except my own. And this false view of the world, everybody's smiling on Instagram, everybody's looking dazzling on, on, on those things. Uh, thank God I'm, I am not on any social media. It's, it's a price I'm willing to pay. I agree completely with you there. Neither and am I. So that puts us in comparison. The moment I am going to compare myself with others, I am setting myself up for misery. That is guaranteed. Because today I might compare myself to somebody who's not as fortunate and I might feel great. Right. Tomorrow I will be seeing somebody who is a lot more fortunate or at an advantageous position than I am and I will feel bad. One, I believe there is more anxiety today than it's ever been. Two, I also believe that privileged life brings anxiety. Sometimes people ask me what was going through my mind when I was in Sydney or Australia. I said survival. I had to survive, and there was no anxiety in there. There was stress, there was anxiety of paying my bill, but that anxiety of life is not good, what are people thinking about me? I didn't have the time to even think about that. Right. So when I meet villagers near my ashram, children or grown-ups or adults, nobody has ever come to me and said, I'm feeling quite depressed. They don't even know what that <coughs> is. True. They're saying, will my harvest be okay this season? Will I be able to retain the roof over my head? Mm. Uh, will my child be okay? They're suffering from brain tumor or something like that. So it's a very subjective thing. I mean, a seed needs to push against the ground for it to sprout. A, a, a caterpillar needs that struggle from that um, pupa, pupa from, to caterpillar to come out of its cocoon and turn into a butterfly. Today, a lot of the kids, we are sheltering them too much. Absolutely. So unless we, unless we don't allow that struggle, they won't really know what life is because life doesn't really care how privileged one may be. Yeah. Life is a teacher, I, I read somewhere, a teacher is someone who um, gives you a lesson and then uh, gives you a test. Right. Life is the opposite. It gives you a test yes. first and then it gives you a lesson. And sees what you can learn out of that. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So if children today, um, they are also under a lot of pressure hmm. because the amount of inequity in the world, the amount of disparity between the very rich and the very poor it's has growing. grown yeah. yes. to unimaginable proportions. Yes. And that is not a good thing for the world. Right. 1% of the people or 2% of the people control 98% of the wealth. And that's not a good thing. Because Absolutely. human beings are inherently self-centered. We are selfless, we are caring by default, but first we are self-centered. 
First, we want to survive, thrive, be famous, be known, be rich, and so on. Yeah. And then I'll care about other people. Right. And right. that's not a good thing, that inequity. I mean, 50 years ago or 60 years ago, the richest person in your village will just have a bigger house or a few more horses. Yeah. Or maybe one car. You, that person would not be flashing his Mont Blanc pen or Versace suit or anything like that. Or those 10 yeah, cars. Yeah, exactly. Land now cars. we can flash our wealth. Yes. And if I can flaunt my wealth, then I'm going to create those desires in other people as well. And I'm not saying desires are right or wrong. As long as I know there is a price to be paid. Hmm. If I want a desire fulfilled, I have a I need to pay a price. I want to grow a business, I need to give less time to the family. I Absolutely. want to work more, I'll have less time for sleeping. As long as I accept the price I am paying, then it's my choice, then I can't complain. Swamiji, um, I want to ask you that time and time again in my conversation with young people, I've seen, you know, maybe we had a little core of faith, perhaps we didn't question so much when we were growing up. You know, we accepted, you can call it sanskar or whatever, but today uh, I'm constantly, you know, this thing comes up that, who is God? Is there a God? Who is God? Is God an idea? Is it an idea that's past its time? And uh, it's something that I find very interesting and I'm going to ask you this question, okay. you know, from your belief that if a young person is asking you, I mean, one is, you know, your own personal connection is, who is God for you? Okay. And uh, if you have to demystify that right. for a young person, what would you say? Okay, I'll try. Okay. Um, there's one thing you mentioned is God an idea that's past its time. Yeah. That reminds me of something, uh, as you know, Friedrich Nietzsche, the, the German yes. uh, thinker, f famously said, God is dead. And uh, in a wall in Germany, his quote was written in a public washroom, or outside a public graffiti, God is dead. Right. And below that was written Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche. Hmm. Below that, somebody scribbled, Nietzsche is dead, God. <laughs> <laughs> so he is actually dead. And when we talk about the concept of death, we usually say, as soon as somebody leaves their body, we say so and so person is dead. Their legacy may be alive, their work may be alive and flourishing, but we say, if somebody's name is Ram Prakash, he, he breathes his last, we say, Ram is dead. Right. But is Ram really dead? Anyway, I don't mean to get into that deep philosophy. In terms of your question directly to me, yes. what God is, the heat in fire is God. The coolness in water is God. That, uh, that coldness in ice is God. That warmth in sun is God. That beauty of a gentle breeze that just simply puts you at ease is God. My definition of God, thank you. My definition of God is the inexplicable essence of all beautiful things in the world. I can give it whatever name I want to give it. I can give it whatever form I want to give it. And it's, we are living in one of those weird times where the moment you use the word God, an educated mind thinks you are either a crook or you're ignorant. The moment you use the word God, they say, oh, here is somebody who's going to now condition us with his thinking. Or here is somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. Or here is somebody who hasn't realized the truth. Right. The reality is, most of what is happening in our lives, we don't control. I can control sitting with you here, but I can't control this audience. Right, right. Uh, they could be creating a lot of ruckus right now. Yeah. Now, we cannot control what's going on around us. Mm. I cannot control an earthquake, no matter how advanced a scientific mind I may have. Mm. I cannot control the bushfires. I cannot control floods and so on. I can mitigate my risk, I can manage them, but I cannot really control them. I'm not saying somebody else up there is calling the shots. Mm. I think that is doing great injustice to the, the glory of human mind. 
I simply believe that the universe is out there in immense magnitude. Right. Just look at the scale of this massive, infinite universe. This universe is in scriptures called Purushottama, right. the ultimate being. If you were to magnify, put your skin under some microscope and magnify, eventually you will see some cells floating around in the space. Right. The way I see human beings connected in all life forms and animate, inanimate objects connected in the world is each one of those is a cell in the universal body. From a distance, they see floating around. And whatever we do think has an impact on every other person in this world. Mm. Each planet is simply a cell in the universe. Absolutely, yes. So we carry within ourselves a microcosm. We have the same Milky Way, the arteries, and we have the same these uh, hair follicles and so on on our body, the way stars are in, this, in the sky. To gain that oneness with the universe mm. is realizing the kingdom of God. That is awakening in my view. That is what God is in my view. Okay. Whether somebody says, uh, has a form, doesn't have a form, it becomes immaterial then. Because it is no longer about what you think is right. It is beyond thought. It is a feeling. We know when somebody falls in love, there is serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin that gets released. But can I evoke feelings of love by injecting those neurotransmitters in somebody? No. I can make them feel good at the most, but I cannot really make them feel loved. Right. So science is explaining everything. Science has a reason and explanation for everything. I wish our religions operated like science. We would have made such remarkable progress. Hats off to the scientific progress of this world. They, there is a humility in science that is missing in religion. I wish religion had the same humility. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I wish religion had the same humility as science does. A scientist says, look, I've reached, I've arrived at this conclusion, here is what I did, here's my paraphernalia, you go through the same thing, you'll get the same result. In religion, we say, no, first you believe what I'm saying to you. Right. And then if you don't get it, it's your fault. Right. So science starts with a hypothesis and then there's a spirit of inquiry. Yes, and science yes. is open to independent validation right. and verification. There is no mumbo jumbo there. But in religion, we say, oh, you don't believe in this book, you are going to hell. Right. This is so ludicrous in my view. Right. This is so uh, remote from the idea of God, you know, which is our deepest essence. So it's a feeling, what I was getting at. I can evoke, I can inject those neurotransmitters, but I cannot make anybody feel loved. Right. Similarly, I can give all the logic and rationale, but I cannot bring that heart to open up to the existence or presence of the divine, whether you call it the universe, divine or anything. That is an individual journey. Right. Whether Einstein found it in his lab, Buddha found it in a tree, or somebody else found it in books, maybe somebody else found it in their family, that's okay. So it's an intangible experience that it elevates you, opens your consciousness, how would you define it, or it's so, indefinable? So one of the most beautiful things that, that happen when you are kind of more mindful and you are one with the universe, all feelings of negativity and hatred go away. You cannot feel any hate or anger towards anybody. And that's a very sweet space to be in in your life because that's gone. Now you, you don't have that negativity. You don't have that hatred for anybody. Everything is okay. But is it because you see the divine in everyone? I mean, how does that happen? That is the beginning. Okay. You see the divine, you feel the divine. You know, in Sufism they say, La Shari Kalahu. Hmm. That he's one without the second. Ekam Brahma Dvityam Nasti. There is no second here. Sometimes people say, this person came, I, I feel very, uh, this ch young child, I feel uh, very, uh, he said, um, fearful, fearful when I'm alone. Right. I said, uh, it's impossible. 
It's impossible to be afraid when you're alone. Clearly, you're thinking. I said, what is the fear? He said, I just feel there is maybe a ghost or, or somebody. I said, clearly, you're thinking there is somebody else. You're not alone, that means. Right, right. You're already thinking there's a presence of somebody else. Yoga ratova, bhoga ratova. Sanga ratova, sanga vahina. Yasyam brahmani ramate chittam nandati 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 eva. That you can be in yoga, you can be in the world in uh, all the joys and bhoga, you can be attached or you can be detached. But the one who is walking with the consciousness of that union with the divine is somebody who is eternally at peace. Now I don't mean to make it uh, very glorifying some mystical thing out there, it's a very practical thing. And it is, I am responsible for what I am feeling. I may not be responsible for what is happening to me. There's a difference between the two. Sometimes we walk into somebody else's karmic field and we suffer or we at least are in pain because of the karma of the other people or other person. If I lose a loved one, I am not responsible for losing that loved one. But if I, am, I think I'm suffering and I'm paying the price, I am responsible for that. Feeling. If you walk into someone else's karmic field, is that not all part of your own karma also? Not necessarily not so. Necessarily. Because I do believe there is extraordinary randomness operating in the universe. Right. Terrible things happen to good people all the time. Okay. And good things happen to bad people all the time. Okay. I think if we, if we say to somebody, look, you are suffering because you did something wrong, something bad in your life, I think that is just empathy torn to shreds. That is being so harsh on the other person when we say, look, you are suffering because, hey, you know, you did something bad in your past yeah. life. Who's to say? Who knows? Maybe that person just suffering. If, if, if I am in a region which is... Uh, let's say, prone to earthquakes and, uh, and I'm buried under some debris, I can say, yes, I'm suffering because I did something bad or maybe I just happened to be there at there, the wrong yeah. place at the wrong time. True. We've seen a lot of people as, uh, who are not intelligent by any stretch of imagination, who possess very ordinary intellects and yet they rise to the top of their game. Sometimes it's just being at the right place at the right, right time. time. Absolutely. And sometimes nature makes that happen. And it's not based on anything. I think we can find theories and reasons and so on, but True. some things just happen in life. Swamiji, you uh, constantly refer to the celestial mother. Right. right? And uh, even now we invoked the mother before we started. Uh, and you have written a beautiful description of your first vision or the first time you met her. Right? Um, would you like to share a bit of that with us? Or, I know you told me that would take you somewhere else otherwise. So, uh, but also the fact that it's the mother. I mean, you know, when we talk about God, uh, it, it's, uh, it's just a force or an energy or an experience. But for you, you have given it a form for yourself yes. as the celestial mother. Right. How did that come about? So, one of my life's core values is truth. In uh, January, on the 1st of January 2011, I promised myself I will never utter a lie, whatever be the price. And so I will tell you truthfully why Divine Mother first. And then briefly about my experience, whatever I can share. If I share a lot, then I need time to myself. Um, I think I may have touched upon it. But when I left my physical mother, I thought, what's the greatest gift I could give her? What's the best I could do? Now that I'm away and she's really wondering where I am because I never told anybody where I was going, uh, so cruelly I left everybody behind, uh, which in hindsight might be a foolish way of doing things. But uh, we all do dumb things It was in like life. the Buddha, yes. actually, now that you mention Buddha. So he True. left too, right? True. So I thought, let me pray to God in the form of mother. Okay. Because 
there is a saying, you know, Kuputro jayet kvachidapi kumata na bhavati. That a son may be a bad son, but a mother is never really a bad mother. Even if she doesn't do anything for you, still she gave you birth. She brought you here. So this was my gratitude to my mother. Thank you. Thank you. And in terms of my experience with her, I think it, I would need people who are devoted to Divine Mother to understand my experience because it's very subjective experience. It has no objective reality. If I share that experience, it would at the best will sound like a hallucination okay. to, 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 to somebody. I need somebody who's in love. I don't want uh, a psychiatrist. Right. right. Right? You see the difference? Yes. So if somebody's in love with the notion of, of God, with such a person, if I sat down and I narrated the glories of Divine Mother, hmm. it would be very different. Here, it would just be flowing from this mind which is pointless, I feel, yeah. because it is doing injustice to this audience to bore them with what my experience was. But I can tell you one thing, yeah. though. I can tell you one thing with absolute conviction and certainty. I already shared with you my definition of the divine. God exists. And uh, somebody who doesn't believe in the presence of God, I'm okay with that as long as they are kind. I always feel yes, yes. whatever makes you a kinder human being, it's a good philosophy. It's a good path, walk it. You know? Absolutely. The world is better off with non-religious kind people than with religious fanatics. Look at all the... Absolutely, yes. The, the violence that is happening in the world. Religious people are at the root of it. They should be cleaned first, I right. feel. Um, but So I was telling you, God exists. And to a, a devotee, the advent of God is same like the, the growing of a tree out of the ground. You put a seed and suddenly you see this tree growing. It's not eating the mud, the earth. Put it in a pot and the earth is still there. If you are giving it 200 grams of two or uh, you know, 20 whatever liters of water in four days, five days, it's not growing at that pace, most of it is evaporating. What is causing the growth of that plant? Air, sunlight, that chlorophyll process, or what is it? Right. Similarly, when you have the seed of devotion, the universe takes on a form for you. And it's incredibly liberating, because then you realize you have the whole universe with you. What do you need what from this need? Yes. world? Then. Being kind, what is being kind? Isn't it just being human? That's your essence, isn't it? So true. And I, I think I recently wrote or spoke, sometimes people come to me and say, why is bad, this bad thing happening to me? I've been so kind to everybody. I've always done good things to people. And I say, okay, so you should be doing bad things to people? <laughs> is that a good enough a qualification that you've always been good to people? I think that's expected. Right. So, being kind is understanding that the person across perhaps hasn't had the same advantage that you had in your life and therefore, what is the best I can do for this individual? It is making a difference to one person as opposed to trying to make a difference to the whole world. Right. And recently, um, I have this thing I do uh, everywhere I... Every time I check out of my hotel, I leave a note, a flower, and some tip for the housekeeping, and I lock the room, and I've checked out. I always feel joyous. What would they discover when they find that note and that right. money? I think if it was just the note, they won't be as joyous. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when they find that money, what would there be? And I was telling Swamiji when we were checking out from Delhi, Marriott, I have this thing that everybody give them some tip, whoever is serving. And I was telling this very simple math, arithmetic to them. I said, we only give 
two or three hundred rupees per person. Right. Right. You spend ten thousand rupees on a dinner, and you are spending much less on tips. So there were, let's say, twenty people. You spend two thousand or three thousand rupees there. I said, imagine those two hundred rupees. They don't sound too much at all. Yeah. But if ten people even or twenty people show them that kindness every day, their kids will study in better schools. Their parents will not die early because they can't afford Medicare. They will also live in air-conditioned homes. They will also have better roofs over their head. So it all adds up. Mm. If I think as a customer, oh, I don't have to give 200 rupees. What will this do? If 20 people thought the same thing, that person is poorer because in this absolutely. country, yeah. in particular, yeah, there is a lot of exploitation. Yes. I always tell the difference between India and some of the Western countries. Here, a security guard will never be dining in, in the dining hall. Mm. They can't afford it. Their one month salary is one meal there. But in the West, it's not like that. Yes. A security on guard one table. day, yes, yes, will over the weekend bring in his family or her family to dine in the same hotel they work in. Yeah. So when we see somebody who's not as fortunate, we can, one view is, hey, they just did it, uh, what's to do? I mean, they didn't study or it's their job, they're just doing their job, but they're not being paid how much they should be paid for that job. Sure. And I feel so bad for the dogs uh, that are in front of every hotel where they're sniffing cars whole day, these poor creatures uh, are just sniffing uh, diesel and fumes, and after every sniff, they don't even get a reward. They don't get a pad, they don't get a chewy, they don't get anything, it's so terrible. What bombs are they trying to sniff? I have no idea. So that kindness is putting a stop to the bad you see around you, but one person, one thing at, at a time. time. Because if I see wrong happening and I choose to be quiet, I'm supporting the wrong. And that's Ellie Wiesel said, you know. Absolutely. It's being complicit, it's being passive, but I'm supporting it. Exactly. If, that means I'm, I'm endorsing. If I choose to be silent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think maybe through the kindness, one could connect with whatever we call God. Exactly. Right? It's, it's a way to get there, right? Without kindness, there is no God. Without kindness, there may be religion, there may be theory, there may be philosophies, there may be protests, there may be organizations, but there is no God. In fact, one day, Angel was sitting with the Satan. Okay. And... Uh, there was this person on this planet Earth, shining, radiant, and so many people were flocking to him. And the angel said to Satan, he said, aren't you worried? Aren't you threatened? Mm. Why? Satan said, why would I be threatened? My existence is imperishable. He said, look, this person has found the truth. And truth will destroy you. This person has found the truth. He has realized the truth. And Satan laughed. Satan said, uh, I am absolutely not worried. At all, huh? He has realized the truth. I will organize the truth and truth will disappear. <laughs> wow, okay. So the moment I put industrial thinking or institutional thinking into a path, the pathless path, so to speak, right. truth goes away and only dry rituals remain behind. Swamiji, I can continue. I've not even sort of touched the tip of whatever I want to ask you, but I think it's time for Q&As. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, I know there are a lot of people who want to ask questions. We have, Pritish, about 10 minutes? Yes. It's... Oh, we have to 11.15. Yeah, so there's 10 minutes more if you want to talk to 15 minutes more questions. Okay, but maybe through the questions then we could, yes. So, there's a time as well, right, in front right, of, on the okay. screen. So that's for our conversation. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, well, there are people who put their hands up. We can just sure. mix it up then. Right, okay, could, perhaps you could have the questions coming in between. Uh, could you just pass the mic to whoever, yeah, yeah. And the people at the back also, yeah? Thank you, Swamiji. Uh, the question of detachment, I just want to ask, that when you are reaching to the fag end of life, like uh, I can say my own age, uh, when I look back, I wonder what uh, I have done, why far I was in this world, 
or what I have achieved in all the life by annexing wealth, industry, or helping somebody. But what is, uh, there was any uh, worth of it? Because I am detached. If I am detached, why there is any worth of it? Can you explain a little bit, enlighten? Sure. It probably was worthless. Uh, I'm just joking, okay. This question of uh, was my life worth it? Every perfectionist, every achiever in life goes through this dogged question of what am I doing here? What is the purpose of my life? Or all that I've been doing, was it even worth it? You see, our priorities change. When our priorities change in life, our definition of what is worthwhile and what isn't changes. So ultimately, in uh, Sufi, the song, they say, Tere amala ne rehna hai bakaya, prone anu jana penda hai. Kalla aya, ethe kalle aya, challe ya. Akha meet ke tu tur jana, challe ya. Tera disna ni ure kite saya, which means this world, everybody is a tenant, everybody is a guest. And the only thing that will be left behind is what we did. As uh, Maya Angelou said, people may forget what you said to them. People may forget what you did to them, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So my life's worth like as in anybody's, is when we can put our hand on our heart and say to ourselves, I did the best I could. Rest is secondary. As a father, as a brother, as a mother, as a sister, as a citizen, as a fellow human being, did I do the best I could? If I did the best I could, I only did what seemed like a good idea at the time. So rest is mind's chattering. If mind is positive, it will make you feel quite worthwhile. If it isn't, it will say, look, this was a waste of life. But the fact that you're alive means nature wants you here. That means you're of some use to the universe because when, it is, when that usage runs out, universe does its own thing and the person appears, ceases to be dead. Right. Thank you. Okay. Maybe we could have a couple of questions together so that it would be, yeah? So, yes, okay. It's not There's in one. my hands, somebody is Sorry, yeah. uh, eagerly raising their hands. Yeah. When people are joyous, they're fulfilled and at peace. So, should our quest be the shape people and the joyous people or good people? Should your quest be what? Should our quest be to shape people into good people and kind people or joyous people? Okay. Should our quest be to shape people into kind people or joyous people? Our quest should only be to help people, really. Who's to, who's to say, who's to judge that the other person isn't kind or is kind? An example I give is if somebody is very kind to the whole world, but they're not kind to you, would you say they're a good person or not a good person? When we say kind person, we are basically saying who's kind to me? If that person is very kind to me, we'll say, lovely person. If that person is not kind to me, I'll say, it's a terrible person. In any case, I think we should help people uh, in whatever way we can, reasonably can. And that, in my mind, is more important. And someone who is kind to all generally is very joyful. Yes. Aren't they? It's... Sometimes kindness uh, is a bit of a sacrifice. And... And because sometimes we are in a place where either you or the other person can have their way. Oh, okay. So you want a coffee, they want something cold, and you can have cold coffee then or something. <laughs> 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 okay, a couple of questions together. Okay. Right, let's just divide it between people from yeah, different ages. Here, here, yeah, please. Let's, let it be random, okay? Good morning. Thank you so At much. At the back also. So both together, yeah, yeah. So my question is, how can one maintain humility and not get overtake, overtaken by a sense of doership or ego while doing random acts of kindness? Okay. It's a good question. Person, okay, so uh. We'll just take two, Swami. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Namaskar, Swami. Thanks a lot for your talk. All of us are really grateful to be here and to uh, hear you. 
my question is this please don't think that this is i'm being judgmental or this is a loaded question you spoke about the fact that when we uh, when we are passive and injustice is happening we are promoting it so i want to, it. we are endorsing it yeah so i want to ask you that uh, would you say that uh, you have uh, you have always stood up stood against injustice which is happening around you and my question also uh, like i'm relating it to the fact that many of the realized beings and awakened beings or spiritual masters don't necessarily question the politics around us or what's happening around us like since the last one month the country has been going through a turmoil and there are many pressing issues which we have been facing so don't you think that spiritual masters like you and others should at least come come forward and put their opinion forward because this can serve as a guide for us we may not necessarily believe with your opinion but this will really serve as a guide for us and many of us will be able to do things which we okay. won't otherwise okay thanks Thank you. Both. Yeah. Your question got the clap. How amazing is that? <laughs> so uh, first, I'll take the question of how to maintain your humility, your humbleness. Uh, please, if I remember one thing in my mind, people don't love or hate who I am. They only love or hate what I can do for them. If what I can give them, they want it, they will love me. If I don't, they will hate me. If I remember that, I will automatically be humble. Plus the fact that, who am I really? A nobody. It is your greatness that you're here to listen to me. It is your greatness that you've called me here. But this world was going on just fine when Om Swami was dead or wasn't alive, wasn't born. This world will go on just fine when I will be gone. So it is just ignorance to think my work is or I am so important that, that the world can't go on without me. And I think that humility comes with just a realization of the truth. There is a, a story I shared with this bird. He was very hungry and he was flying in the skies trying to spot its prey. And it saw a little fish floating about in, um, in one of the ponds. Immediately took a dive, grabbed the fish and off it went. Bigger vultures came after it and started hitting it. Soon it was blooded and that fish slipped out of his claws. The bigger birds, the vultures and eagles, all went after that fish. This little bird sat on a tree, on a branch, perched on a branch and was licking its wounds and said to itself, Oh, I thought they were my enemies, but all they wanted was the fish. When they got the fish, they left me alone. So people, when it's, it's not who anybody is, but what they can do for the world. They say, Lobhi yashchaha maan gumani, nabduhi dhud chahat e prani. If you want to be famous, you have to give something to the world. Whether that's uh, your time, your knowledge, your wealth, whatever that is. So, humility comes automatically when you know you are just an instrument. If today, in this audience right now, I say things that hurt your sentiments, you will immediately start disliking me. If I say, you, some of you practice religion or different kinds of religion, if I say bad things about that, some of you might be willing to kill me, you know? So it's, so where is the room for ego or where is the room for, oh, my work is so important? I was telling Punitaji before I came, I turned down 99% of the speaking invitations. I only accept less than 1% of the invitations. And the simple reason, today technology allows you to, to reach out to people, I don't think people are really waiting to hear me. I think life is going on just fine, and that keeps you Thank grounded. Thank you for accepting our invitation. No, thank, thank you, really. Thanks. So, uh, the other question you asked, if you don't know about the subject matter, either you read about it, learn it, or you be quiet about it. So, you know, I, I think being a spiritual guru, uh, first of all, it's not a term ever used for myself, a guru, but being a spiritual guru or a leader or somebody, uh, a speaker or whatever name you want to give, does not mean you have to comment on everything that is there. If I don't know the subject matter, I have not read, for example, you spoke about indirectly referred to CAA yeah. and NRC and all that. I have not read the fine print. And then to base my opinion based on the reports in the media is sheer ignorance. It's actually misguiding people a lot more. If people who are really, I feel that, 
If decision makers sat with me and said, we have come up with this law, what is your opinion on this? I would then say, I would like to read it and then give my opinion. A rule of thumb I can tell you, I think we are done with division in this country. Absolutely. We've suffered enough. Absolutely. And we really don't need that shit anymore. I really feel that it's time. Uh, there's a, this uh, thing I uh, tell sometimes, this husband uh, brought uh, a bouquet for his wife on their 25th anniversary. And it was, they were, the bouquet had white roses. And the wife looked at it and said, white? This should be red. Red signifies love, wow. red signifies passion. This is white. And the husband said, honey, after 25 years of being with you, I think I need more peace than I need love <laughs> in my life. <laughs> so, at this time, after more than 70 years of independence, we don't need division. We don't need all this politics. It is not doing the country good. It is distracting us from the real issues. We need growth, we need employment, we need Medicare, we need better education. We need those things. They are the need of the Absolutely. hour. Thank we are you. not going to become world number one or the world's leading economy by just uh, distracting people with all this nonsense and putting our youth, the energy of the citizens, into lodging protests. We, why to even mess with people. We have real issues to deal with. Why don't we focus on those? Why doesn't the government focus on those? We, I think we are, and it is so frustrating and helpless, the blood boils that we are tax-paying citizens of this nation. We are paying taxes, you know, all the infrastructure we see around, we are paying taxes and we have to put up with uh, this uh, debauched lifestyle of uh, all these politicians who live in absolute luxury when our common people are suffering and they're living in luxury because you are paying taxes, I am paying taxes. My tax money is going to places where it absolutely hurts me to see that and I seem to be able to do nothing about it. Year after year, month after month, Somebody comes around, promises something, we buy into it, and we are fooled over and over and over again. And it's, um, it's very disturbing, to say the least. Any, any nation, anything, sorry, I'll just sum it yes, up in a, in yes. a sentence or two. Anything that brings our country together, anything that makes people kinder, any initiative that creates employment, any initiative that makes the lives of ordinary citizens better is worth considering. Anything to the contrary should be shot down to the ground. No. Thank you, Swamiji. I wish more influencers would think like you. And, yeah. okay. Pranam, Thank you. A couple Pranam, more questions. I think he's saying. Pranam Swamiji. Pranam? Okay. Uh, where are you? I'm standing over here. Okay. Swamiji, you talked about detachment. So this is the last question, sorry. You talked about detachment. Uh, my question is, isn't attachment or passion that gives juice to life, isn't my quality of life determined by how much I'm into it and how passionate I am? So passion does not mean you cannot be detached. Having passion does not mean I cannot be detached. There is attachment, there is non-attachment, and then there is detachment. Attachment is when a patient is sick, Attachment is what he or she has to their body. Detachment is what they have with the doctor. Patient is detached with the doctor somewhat. Mine, if this doctor is dead, I will find another one. It's inconvenient, but I will find one. Non-attachment is what the doctor has with the patient. And if I can cultivate non-attachment in my life, I will actually be a million times more effective at everything that I undertake. So I think that's... Thank you. In fact, uh, Swamiji has a very interesting, um, in the book he talks about physical intimacy uh, done with mindfulness can actually translate into a divine offering. I thought that was very interesting, your take on, you know, sexual relationships, etc. How it can move beyond just a physical act. So, I mean, I'm sorry, we need to wind up. There's so much more and I think this was just like a teaser, Swamiji. Sure. I certainly <laughs> sure. want thank to know a lot more. Sure. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for being this audience. I know a lot of you all want to 
come and ask more questions. Swamiji is going to be at the bookstore signing. Okay. At the book signing. At the Z kiosk. At the Z kiosk. Oh, right here. Right here. Okay. So, so yeah. I'll quickly do a closing chant. Please. Because we call Please. Divine Mother. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamada Chate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Hari Om Tatsat Hari Om Tatsat Hari Om Tatsat Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, on behalf of the festival and the Nexa Front Lawn, and I believe I speak for everyone here, a uh, big, big thank you for Swamiji for accepting the invitation to speak here, of course, for sharing all of his thoughts with us, and of course to Punita Ji for facilitating the conversation. As she just mentioned, Swamiji will be signing copies of his book, The Book of Kindness, at the Z kiosk. Uh, it's right behind the front lawn to the right, as you can see. And the next session, we will return quite shortly at 11.15 a.m. On the eve of Republic Day, the session is titled Of the People, By the People, The Indian Constitution. Naveen B. Chavla, Madhav Khosla and Margaret Alva will be in conversation with Saif Mahmood. This session will be presented by Dainik Bhaskar. And while we would like you to stay here with us in the Nexa Front Lawn, uh, you could head over to Charbagh, where there will be a session titled Climbing the Mango Trees, Food and Memory, where Madhur Jafri will be in conversation with Chandrahas Chaudhary, presented by UFO Movies. At the Mughal Tent, Vogue House, Nicholas Coleridge will be in conversation with Divya Thani. This session will be presented by Inox. At the Bank of Baroda, Bethuk, Partition Voices, Kavita Puri and Sam Dalrymple will be in conversation with Anchil Malhotra and this session will be presented by Avid Learning. If you want to head over to Motwani Jadeja Foundation Darbar Hall, the session there is Twice Born Writers, The Bilingual Imagination, Anukriti Upadhyay, Kunal Basu and Aruni Kashyap will be in conversation with Mal Shri Lal and this will be presented by Matribhumi. And finally, Samvad is hosting Rewriting London. Guy Gunaratne and Ben Judah in conversation with Elaine Canning. But let me again state my preference for having you stay right here. Thank you and we'll see you at 11.15 for Off the People, By the People, the Indian Constitution. Thank you.